Hello, and welcome to another episode of the RTI Health Advanced Series on Social Determinants of Health. My name is Denise Clayton. I'm a health economist at RTI Health Advance, and I'm joined today by my colleague, Lisa Lines, a senior health services researcher. Previously, we talked about challenges with social determinants of health data, RTI's local social inequity score, or LSI, and some key applications and findings from our own analyses. Today, we're excited to be talking about the importance of neighborhood level data along with individual level data. First, I think it makes sense to acknowledge the role of individual level data for social determinants of health. So Lisa, do you wanna tell us a little bit first about why and how individual level data is valuable? Uh, you know, individual level data on social risk factors um, enables payers and providers to identify, you know, which people and which needs, because you can't address a need if you don't know it exists. So neighborhood level data is not meant to replace that individual level data on risk factors um, that exist at the individual level, like uh, food insecurity, not having enough food. Yep, that's a great point. And I think that it's also important that individual level data is not only important to be able to identify who and what intervention, but you know those individual circumstances can change over time. So you really need up-to-date individual level data. That's really the, the data point you need if you're trying to determine whom to target a uh, given intervention. Um, but you mentioned food insecurity. I think that's a great example of the importance of neighborhood level data because the right intervention for someone experiencing food insecurity might be different if they live in a healthy food desert versus an area with lots of food access, but where the real root issue is income or even transportation. Can you talk a little bit about the value of neighborhood level data, both on its own and in conjunction with individual level data? Yeah, I mean, there, there are definitely um, some measures where the neighborhood level is the right level of data in the first place. I mean, think about air pollution. I mean, uh, certainly there's indoor air pollution and outdoor air pollution, but if you're going to measure outdoor air pollution, you're probably going to be measuring at a neighbor, neighbor, neighborhood level. Um, same with something like <clears throat> access to, you know, transportation, public transportation, um, whether there are um, airports you know, nearby, manufacturing facilities, factories, um, uh, you know, solid waste facilities. These are all things that are um, you know, important in terms of causing pollution, maybe air pollution, maybe um, toxic uh, you know, water pollution. Um, and so certainly um, everybody in that neighborhood is subjected to that pollution. And, and then there are also situations where the neighborhood level data, you know, complements individual data. So say you know that a particular child has severe asthma and they're ending up in the emergency department. You know, and if this patient lives in a place where there's low quality or older housing stock, maybe there is an environmental issue that's exacerbating that asthma, um, old carpets or poor indoor air quality. Um, so knowing those neighborhood level data points on housing stock, um, air quality could help you address the underlying cause of that asthma. Uh, or maybe it's, you know, they're living near a highway and um, not much you can do about that, but um, you won't know about that unless you, you have that neighborhood level data. And uh, so, you know, without that neighborhood level information, you continue to address the asthma attacks after they happen instead of addressing the root cause. Yep, no, that's a great point. And I think there's also, there are examples like that across a lot of different disease states, even related to screening or the adoption of vaccines. In some cases, there might be neighborhood level data points that can help you understand what the best intervention is. It might be an individual level intervention for a specific disease state, but given the context of the individual in a certain neighborhood, there might be other interventions that will help not only that individual, but others as well. So I'm really glad you kind of raised that asthma point. Uh, that's a really good example. Um, you know, a, a lot of people ask about how do you work with the individual level and neighborhood data together? Um, how do you merge these data sets? How does that work? So generally, um, what, what tip what people typically do is that they, they would, uh, you, you know, end up putting in lots of different indicators into, um, into a model. And um, uh, what, 
what we have instead is this single score, sort of a composite measure, an omnibus measure that captures over 150 different indicators that going into that score. And, um, and so that way you don't have to um, uh, chase down, you know, 20 different uh, variables and then worry about collinearity and uh, making your model blow up, but instead you just have that one, one variable that can go um, at the zip code level, at the census tract level, or at the county level. Um, at the census tract level, and even smaller than that is, is more ideal because you're dealing with smaller numbers of people and so the estimates are um, not, as, not as broad, right? Um, but if you just have zip code level information, that will also be fine. I mean, it, it tells you, um, you know, something about the area where a person lives. Um, and then county level is the, the least, you know, ideal because I mean, think about I live in Los Angeles County and 10 million people, you know, it's hard to make an estimate that's really valid across 10 million people. So, <clears throat> but, um, you know, so if you get, if you can get the census tractors at code level, uh, that's, that's much, much better. Um, and if you have individual level data, if you have an individual's address, um, you can get actually census block level if you have their nine digit zip code. Uh, but a five digit zip code will work. And if you can merge um, that individual level data with the zip codes into, um, you know, onto the scores or, or individual predictors, um, you can uh, combine the power of the information that you have about the individual with the place where they live. Um, and that, that actually, you know, gives you a much better picture of someone's particular situation than just looking at neighborhood or just looking at uh, individual. And the nice thing is about the LSI, you know, it exists at the census tract, zip code tabulation area or county level, like you were saying. Um, but in addition to having that LSI variable, which is, like you said, that omnibus measure of risk, the data set that goes into creating that score is the 150 plus variables. So the LSI is there when you need that high level overall risk score that correlates strongly with life expectancy at birth. But as part of the data set that's at that granular geographic level, we also have all those 150 plus input variables. So all the environmental or you know the food related factors that are all in there as well. So that can be combined with the individual level data in addition to the LSI, which I think is a really powerful tool. Absolutely. All right. Yeah, thank you so much, Lisa, for talking with me today and to everyone for joining us for this, this discussion. I always enjoy getting to talk about health equity and sharing RTI's insights on social determinants of health. If you'd like to learn more about RTI's local social inequity score or how it could be used in your organization, you can connect with us at rtihealthadvance.org. We're happy to talk with you.